Good afternoon. Right, so we've been hearing a lot today about the importance of improving computer security. As Dan just alluded to, though, it's not just traditional computers that we need to worry about. There are many other kinds of systems as well. The slide that's been omitted uh, showed a result of uh, the researchers at UCSD and the University of Washington hacking into the dashboard display of a typical American sedan, making it show that the car was going 140 miles an hour while in park. Drilling down a little bit, modern vehicles consist of between 30 and 100 embedded control units, which are essentially small computers connected via a CAN bus. These cars are required by law to have a diagnostic port, typically located under the steering wheel, that allows mechanics to download diagnostic information and to perform software updates. In a first paper, the researchers from UCSD and the University of Washington showed that if they could touch the CAN bus through that diagnostic port, they could take over all of the functionality of the car that's controlled by software. And in a modern automobile, that's pretty much everything. The brakes are controlled by software because of anti-lock braking. The acceleration is controlled by software because of cruise control. And in those fancy new cars that can park themselves, even the steering is under software control. The reaction to this first paper was somewhat muted, perhaps because if the researchers had access to that diagnostic port, they were inside the car and so already had physical access to the brakes, acceleration, and steering. They responded with a second paper in which they showed a variety of ways of touching that CAN bus without physically touching the car. These attacks involved infecting uh, the computers in the repair shop and then having that inspection, infection spread to the car through the diagnostic port, or hacking in through the Bluetooth system, or using the cell phone network to break in through the telematics unit that's normally used to provide roadside assistance. The most ingenious attack, though, used the stereo system in the car. The researchers were able to craft an electronic version of a song that played just fine in your home stereo system or on your personal computer. But when you put that on a CD and played it in the car CD player, it took over total control of your automobile. Yeah, right, pretty scary, huh? These vulnerabilities arise because the cyber components that form the interface of these cars are built from the same kinds of buggy components that are in your personal computers. And the control systems that are actually running the car have no notion that there can be an attacker sitting on the CAN bus. So commercial automobiles are not the only kind of non-traditional computer that are vulnerable to attack. We have to worry about all these other kinds of systems as well. Everything from SCADA systems that control things like the power grid and canal systems, to medical devices like the insulin pump shown on the slide, to computer peripherals, communication devices, and various kinds of vehicles. Researchers and or attackers have shown that systems in each of these categories are vulnerable to attack. For example, for SCADA systems, the attacks on the Marucci Shire sewage plant in Australia, say that 10 times fast, and the Ginac Canal system in France show that even supposedly air gap systems are vulnerable to remote attack and that those attacks can cause physical damage while hiding evidence of the attack from local monitoring. As for medical devices, Jerome Radcliffe showed at this year's Black Hat that he could wirelessly hack into his insulin pump and cause it to deliver incorrect dosages of the medicine. Hacked thumb drives are a notorious way of spreading infections across air gaps, while compromised routers have exfiltrated information. As for communication devices, the Droid Dream malware in the Android store shows the vulnerability of smartphones. As for vehicles, we've already talked about commercial automobiles. In addition, in October, various media sources reported that the ground control systems supporting the Reaper and the Predator drones were suffering for computer viruses. Many of these systems share a common structure. They have an insecure cyber perimeter constructed from standard software components surrounding control systems designed for safety but not for security. So how are we going to make these systems more secure? Right. Well, the state of the art on the traditional computer side is to add antivirus anti scanning, intrusion detection systems, and a patching infrastructure. Unfortunately, this kind of approach, as we've been hearing today, is never going to fundamentally solve this problem for two reasons. The first is that these systems are looking for known vulnerabilities and often can't find unanticipated zero-day attacks. Second, these uh, monitoring systems are themselves really complicated software systems and can themselves introduce new vulnerabilities and privilege escalation opportunities. As we saw earlier when Dan presented the cyber analytic framework, a third of the vulnerabilities in the October 2010 vulnerability watch list were themselves coming from security products. To solve this problem then, we need a fundamentally different approach. 
One possibility is to use design for assurance and other formal method based techniques to build high assurance versions of cyber physical systems, versions where the implementations are proven to satisfy a functional specification and to be resilient in the face of an attack. This is the approach that I'm interested in exploring. Next slide, right. Okay, so this slide shows both why a formal methods based approach is promising and also why it's still a really difficult problem. The horizontal axis lists a number of operating system components, while the vertical axis lists the correspondingly corresponding number of lines of code on a log scale. The systems in green are those that have been formally verified, by which I mean the implementation has been proven to satisfy a functional specification. Those in blue have yet to be verified. The ones in light blue correspond to various versions of the Linux kernel. Researchers have been able to verify the systems in green because of recent fundamental advances in the formal methods community, advances including things like SAT and SMT solvers, separation logic, theorem provers, and model checkers. The current state of the art is verifying roughly 10,000 lines of C code written with the intent of being verified. In this program, we'd like to push the state of the art out to about 200,000 lines of code. The graph shows that if we're successful, we'll be able to verify key operating system components that we can then leverage to build high assurance cyber systems. The critical challenge here is reducing the level of effort required to produce such high assurance systems. The team that verified the SEL4 microkernel estimated that it took them 11 person years to verify the 9,000 lines of code. Now assuming, optimistically, that verification effort scales linearly with the number of lines of code, the SEL4 experience suggests that it would take roughly 12,000 person years to verify the current version of the Linux kernel. Further optimistically assuming that each such person year costs about $100,000, that would give it a price tag of over $120 million. Well okay, that level of effort might be okay to do if you only had to do it once. But software evolves quickly, right? The uh, graph shows seven different versions of the Linux kernel, but there actually have been dozens and dozens of stable versions of Linux released in the last 20 years. To succeed then, we need to dramatically lower the level of e effort required to produce these high assurance systems. Next slide, thank you. Right, so that's the problem that my program is going to tackle. We're going to work on building high assurance versions of cyber physical systems using a clean slate, formal methods based approach. To succeed, we're going to make, need to make significant progress in three main areas. First, fundamental advances in formal methods, denoted by the box with the zeros and ones. Second, fundamental advances in the design of control systems, denoted by the graph with the uh, differential equations in it. Third, we need to be able to integrate these two kinds of technology to produce high assurance components and systems, denoted by the blue arrow and the pictures of the cyber physical systems. I'll briefly describe each of these components in turn. First, on the formal methods front, we need to dramatically reduce the level, the cost, time, and expertise required to produce these high assurance systems. That requires fundamental advances in formal methods to increase the level of automation and to decrease the time to initial verification for new systems. We also need to work on what I've been calling proof engineering by analogy with software engineering to reduce the time to modified verification for modified systems. In particular, if we have a verified component and we need to add a new piece of, a new piece of functional functionality or a new feature, the re-verification effort should be proportional to the interface of the original system plus the size of the new feature, not doing everything all over again from scratch. Or if we have a verified component on a particular piece of hardware and we need to port it to a new piece of hardware, the re-verification effort should be proportional to the change in the hardware, not redoing everything again from scratch. Moving on to the control system side, we need to develop techniques for designing control systems that are resilient in the face of attack. This might involve leveraging the laws of physics as a ground truth to determine when the system is under attack. Then, we need to develop graceful ways of responding to such attacks. You probably can't just reboot your car as it's speeding down the highway. Once we have these technologies in place, we need to be able to integrate them in such a way that we can prove that the cyber and physical components are working together properly. Using these technologies then we can build then the high assurance components that we can then compose to build high assurance cyber physical systems. Next slide. Right, so I'm just in the progress process of setting up this program. So if you have questions, comments, things that you think I should know about, things that you think I should be thinking about, please feel free to contact me. The best way to reach me is my email address, which is shown on the slide. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>